Hello, everybody. This is Brother Aiden with ChristianInterviews.com. I have a very special guest today that I think is uh, just literally going to move you. I don't know how else to say it. Um, as you know, we give away these interviews away for free to help build up the body of Christ. And some of you have heard of Voice of the Martyrs, and some of you have not. So I'll just kind of kind of brag on the ministry a little bit. But I have on the line uh, here today Todd Nettleton, who's been with them for many years. How are you this morning, Todd? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Great. And you can correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I read Tortured for Christ about 10 years ago by Pastor Richard Warmbrand, who was uh, a Romanian pastor and thrown in prison numerous times. Finally, after many, many years, came to the U.S., testified before the U.S. Uh, Senate or Congress, and then he started Voice of the Martyrs, and basically a very powerful ministry that helps persecuted Christians around the world that I've personally supported for years and I love. And um, um, that's the basic gist of it. But correct me if I'm wrong, Todd. No, you're right on track. Uh, Pastor Wormbrand spent a total of 14 years in prison. Uh, he, When he left Romania, he was actually ransomed out of the country. So Christians in the West paid a ransom to the Romanian government to release him and allow him to leave. He traveled all over the world sharing the stories of, of what he had endured in prison, but even more importantly, I think, pointing back to those Christians and those pastors who were still in those prisons and calling on people to pray for them, calling on people to support them and encourage them. And out of that ministry and out of his own testimony, the Voice of the Martyrs was born, and now we've been going a little more than 45 years serving the persecuted church around the world. Praise God. Yeah, what a powerful ministry. So if you could share um, a couple of stories, maybe one, two, or three, of things that are happening now. Now, we don't like to date these interviews because we want to use them for 10 or 20 years, but uh, you know, we're obviously not in the 60s, 70s, 80s, or 90s, early 2000s, so there's things that are happening right now that you could maybe share um, so that Christians can pray and, and, and possibly uh, help in other ways, too. I think what I would share, the, one of the countries that immediately comes to my mind is Iran. And uh, the nation of Iran is an Islamic republic. The government there is the mullahs. The, the top level authorities are the mullahs. They're the Islamic leaders in the country. They make the final decisions. They have say in how the government is run. This is a nation where about 40 believers, a little more than 40 Christian believers, are currently in prison in Iran. They're being held. Uh, some of them are charged with undermining the government. Uh, some are charged with the crime of apostasy or changing your religion from Islam to something else. Uh, there's various charges that are used, but the bottom line is they're in jail in Iran for being Christians, for choosing to follow Jesus Christ. And one of the great things, though, about Iran, the, the bad news sort of is that there are 40 of our Christian brothers and sisters in jail. The good news is there's an incredible revival that's going on in Iran, and the people of Iran are absolutely hungry for the gospel. They're hungry for the good news of Jesus Christ. And one of the amazing things that God has done is he's using the Islamic government of Iran to push people towards Jesus Christ because the people look at the government and they know that the mullahs are in charge. They know that, that the government says we're running everything according to how the Quran says we should. And so when the government fails or when there's corruption or when there's an election that everyone knows didn't turn out the way it was announced to have turned out, they look at that and they say, well, the government fails, but the government is Islam. So Islam has failed. And so they are incredibly open to you know, what else is out there? Islam clearly doesn't work, they say, when they look at their government. So what else is out there? And into that void, there are ministries like Voice of the Martyrs. Some of our partners are broadcasting on TV. Some are delivering Bibles into Iran. But the people of Iran are hungry for the gospel, and there's an incredible revival that's going on there. But obviously it's coming with a price. Those 40 people in prison are paying that price willingly. Yeah. Yeah, they are, absolutely. To, to, to die is to gain. So do you think that the Western Christians, I've always wondered, do you think that they just don't know about what's going on or they don't care what's going on? 
I hope it's I hope it's the first. So I apologize up front. I hope it's the first and not the second, because if you know and you just don't care, that really is a a condemning thing on your own heart and on your own uh, mind. But I think there is a vast number of of American Christians that don't know. They just you know they've never heard. Nobody's ever told them and. They, you know, there is a, a great deal of the Christian population that they read the book of Acts and they move on into Romans and they just think, well, you know, that was the end of persecution. They did that back in Bible times, but surely that doesn't happen anymore today. And, and they just don't know about what's happening in communist countries. They don't know about what's happening in Islamic countries. And so uh, that is a, a big part of it. There is a part of the American church that doesn't care. I, I think... Uh, you know, there's there's a part of the American church that thinks uh, God somehow we come to God and He makes everything lovely in our life right here on Earth, and He uh, gives us you know new cars and big houses, and that is not the reality here in America, and it's certainly not the reality in China or in Egypt or in Syria. Uh, and so there are some, and I and I think sometimes willfully they don't want to know. Because if they did know, then they would have to respond. They would have to decide, okay, am I going to care or not? Uh, and if they don't know, they never have to make that decision. No, you're absolutely right. Because the Bible says you're responsible for the knowledge you get. So that's why I'm glad we're doing this interview and people are going to listen to it. And now they're going to be responsible to the <laughs> Lord. And I, I, I tell people there's a purpose for the prosperity and there's a purpose for the power. And that purpose is souls. And not just the unsaved souls, absolutely the unsaved, that goes without saying, but also the souls of, of our brothers and, and our sisters. So what, what is going on in, say, let's just say India or Laos or Vietnam or Cuba? I literally have a map on my wall from Voice of the Martyrs. You guys sent me about five years ago, and it has two color codes on this map. And I encourage everybody to get it from you guys. And it's got dark green and light green. It has restricted nations and uh, hostile nations, or how, they're, how, they're, how they're listed on the wall here. Yeah, let, let me explain the difference between those. And, and by the way, that map, we will send that to any of our listeners that, that give us a call, come on our website. Uh, that's part of something we do is we want people to know what's going on. We want them to be able to pray. So that prayer map and our monthly newsletter are part of that ministry. We identify, we divide the countries where Christians are persecuted into restricted and hostile. And the basic difference between the two is who's doing the persecution. If it's the government that's doing the persecution, then we call that a restricted nation. And that's a country like China, where the communist government is coming against the church, like North Korea, where the government is the persecutor. The countries that we call hostile areas are places where, at least on paper, the government says it's okay to be a Christian, it's okay to go to church, it's okay to do Christian activities. But within that country, there are forces against the church, and maybe it's radical Muslims, maybe it's radical Hindus in India, uh, that those people are coming against Christians, they're coming against the church, even though the government per se says, yeah, it's okay to be a Christian. Those are the places that we identify as hostile nations. And then uh, we've added in the last couple of years a, a, a third category. We call them monitored countries, and it's basically where you know, we're starting to hear some stories of persecution, and we're watching. Is this is this one isolated incident that happened, or is this becoming a pattern? Is there ongoing persecution of Christians? And so those countries are the ones we, we call them monitored. We're monitoring the situation for the church there and waiting to see if, if it will move on to the point where they become either a hostile or a restricted nation. Wow. I, I'm a from five years back is Monday. So give me give me three or four countries that are monitored and, and what Well one of the countries that we've added to the monitored list just this year was Tanzania. It was on our on our map as a monitored country in two thousand thirteen. Early this year, back in February, we saw in the span of about ten days two pastors in Tanzania were killed. Uh, one right outside his church, uh, another in a different part of the country was an Assembly of God pastor. And so uh, that's something that we're watching. And again, is is that the first chapter in an ongoing story, or is that kind of an isolated incident? Did something happen that where pastors were killed? So those are some of the things we're watching. Another country that's monitored, and it's actually right next door, is Kenya. And, you know, Kenya is predominantly a Christian nation. 
But within Kenya, there are areas that are heavily Islamic. There are groups of Somali refugees that are coming across from Somalia. Some of them are bringing radical Islam along with them as they come into Kenya. And so we're monitoring that situation. What's happening with the church there? Uh, the attacks that we see, are they isolated incidents? Are they a pattern? Uh, so those are some of the countries that we're watching to see what happens as we move forward into 2014. Yeah, wow. Uh, it brings a whole new level of, uh, the words, trust the Lord. You know, um, I mean, because I don't think people realize, it, but, you know, some of the listeners do know what we're saying, but some of them don't realize that when those pastors are killed in Tanzania, or thrown in jail in other places, there's literally nothing in the natural that the person can do. Is that correct, Bob? That's often the case. You know, in some cases there are, you know, legal remedies or they can hire a lawyer or whatever, but many times it is simply, it's them and God. I mean, they, they are thrown in jail. And the interesting thing, and it's fascinating to me as an American Christian, is I have literally heard persecuted Christians who have come out of jail and they talk glowingly about the experience. I remember a lady named Sister Tong that I met in China, and when I met her, she had just been released after six months in jail, and I was relatively new to VOM at that time, and I was still kind of learning about the persecuted church learning, and so I asked her, I said, you know, so tell me about the prison, and what I'm thinking in my mind is, you know, tell me how bad it was. Tell me how big the rats were. Tell me how uncomfortable it was. And Sister Tong got this amazing smile on her face, and she said, oh, yes, that was a wonderful time. <laughs> and I looked at the translator because I thought he'd messed up. You know, I thought, you know, no, 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 I'm asking about the prison. And she smiled and nodded her head. Yeah, yeah, the prison, that was a wonderful time. And she went on to talk about just how the Lord had ministered to her while she was in prison and how she'd had the opportunity to share the gospel with some of her cellmates and the ladies who were in the cell with her. And some of them also received the Lord and committed their life to follow him. And so when she looked back on that six months in prison, she saw it as a time where the Lord was especially close, as a time where she had a very effective ministry to the people around her. And she literally identified it. Oh, yes, that was a wonderful time. And she's not the only one. I have, I've literally had persecuted Christians say to me, I kind of miss those days in prison because they talk about how faithful God was. They talk about how every moment of the day they just relied on him and lived in fellowship with him. And they literally say, you know, I kind of miss that. I kind of miss the prison. And, you know, as an American, I, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. That just blows my mind. But that literally is, is what they say and, and what they feel. Yeah, well, it's biblical. He said, rejoice when you're persecuted, what Jesus said, and so, praise the Lord. Um, so, tell us about the different um, uh, funds, because I know there's the, there's the pastor's funds, or the widow's funds, for the pastor being killed, and then there's, um, I think there was like five or six different areas that uh, Voice of the Martyrs uh, does for the persecuted church. Let me tell you, there, there's three funds that we focus on for overseas work, uh, and then there's a fourth fund. I'll just run down quickly. The first one is Bibles to Captive Nations, and that is a fund that is to deliver Bibles into hostile and restricted nations. This year, we will deliver more than a million Bibles into the hardest, most difficult places in the world to get Bibles into. Uh, those include uh, electronic Bibles, e-books, audio Bibles, printed Bibles, New Testaments. So that's the Bibles to Captive Nations Fund. The second fund is the Frontline Ministries Fund. And that's really one of the things that we do is we provide tools to the church to help them be the body of Christ in these hostile and restricted nations, to help them reach out to their neighbors and their friends. And so that includes things like gospel tracts or like a motorcycle for a pastor to help him get around and shepherd his flock there in that restricted nation. The third fund is the Families of Martyrs Fund, and that is, uh, I, I think, the one you're referring to, where literally it's to help the families of persecuted Christians. If your husband is killed, you need support. You need help. Uh, you need some funds. In some cases, we need to get the widow to a safe place, 
in some cases, we simply need to help her with uh, what's going on in her life. If your husband is in jail and he's the breadwinner, you need help. Uh, and so the Families of Martyrs Fund is for that. Then our fourth fund, our last fund, is the Voice Outreach Fund. And that really is to equip us to be the voice of the martyrs to the American church, to tell the stories of persecuted Christians in order to encourage American Christians and inspire us. That includes things like this radio broadcast. Putting We put on conferences around the country where we invite people to come out and spend a Saturday with us and hear the stories of the persecuted church. Those things that are involved in being a voice for the persecuted church come out of that voice outreach fund. Yeah, I, I got invited a few years back. I wasn't able to make it to one in Texas, and I liked the way that the speakers weren't just American speakers, but they were actually persecuted pastors you guys have flown in. I, I guess that happens at some of those conferences. That happens at many of them. We will have a, a speaker from outside the country. Uh, I was at a conference in Atlanta just about two months ago. We had uh, a pastor from China who is a formerly imprisoned pastor. Uh, we had two ladies from Iran who had been in prison in Iran because of their Christian testimony. Uh, so those conferences are a great way to spend a Saturday. You will not leave the same way you came in the door because you will be challenged and encouraged. Uh, and one of the other great things about them is, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but we draw the cream of the cream from the American church to come into these conferences. You'll meet Christian brothers and sisters who like you do, have a heart for the persecuted church, have a heart to really serve the Lord no matter the cost, no matter what they have to give up to do that. And, you know, when you get a room full of those kind of Christians, that's, that's a great place to be. Oh, yeah. I encourage everybody to go to those conferences or read the, the, the Torture for Christ book. And we'll share that at the end here. Um, because when you do that, and the next time you get persecuted by your coworker or family members, you'll just laugh. <laughs> are you kidding me? Like words? Words are just, I mean, from people compared to prison, I mean, it'll just get a great perspective for you. And here's the key for my American brothers and sisters. Uh, when, when you have no fear of man, you are then bold as a lion. And uh, so, you know, we want to reach people all around the world. But praise the Lord. That's, that's good stuff. Hey, i got a side question. Um, um, and, I, and I know uh, I don't. I have no idea on any of the doctrine stuff. I usually never get any of that stuff. But I've been to Madagascar, Peru, Philippines. I've been to many places, and it, and it seemed like I don't know. Eighty percent of the Christians are spirit-filled. You know, really believe in miracles and the gifts, and I obviously do. And, and I push that. I, I love everybody who's a Christian who doesn't believe in gifts. That's fine. I still love them, and God loves them. I just I just believe that you know we're equipped with extra tools to get to get the work done. Is that your experience from a lot of these persecuted Christians in areas of a high percentage spirit-filled or no? Uh, I think that's true, yes. Um, at the same time, it's not 100% true. It's not necessarily the rule. We had a story just a, a couple months ago of a family in Vietnam uh, that was being kicked out of their village because they were Christians. The village basically said, we don't want any Christians here. If you're going to be a Christian, you can't live here. And they got up and moved out of the village, forced out of the village, and they literally had been believers for like less than three months. I mean, they just had barely heard the gospel and come to Christ, and yet they still had the faith and they had the, the strength of their faith to say, no, no, we're not going to give it up. Even if we have to move out of our village, we're not going to give up our faith in Christ. So we see... We see all the whole span, really, of, of spiritual experience and theological experience as well. So we, uh, our, our position is we're, we're an interdenominational ministry. We work with those who suffer for the name of Christ. We really feel like if you're willing to stand up and be counted as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, even when it costs you something, uh, that's, those are the people we want to stand with sort of regardless of what their theological background is or, or what level of understanding they have of what that means. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm, I've never known. I've given you guys money for years. <laughs> I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to me at all. We're, we're going to help, we're gonna help our, our brothers and sisters. For, wow. So is there uh, any couple more? Um, we got about eight more minutes, nine minutes. Miracle stories of... I know there's lots of sad stories, and I'm and I'm and I'm glad those are shared. Uh, but uh, maybe share one or two of uh, uh, just miracle stories. 
one of the people that I met earlier this year was a, a pastor in Nigeria. Uh, his name was John Ali Doro, and uh, I spent some time with him last year in 2012. Uh, his village came under attack by the Fulani Muslim herdsmen, and it, it, there was a day, it was in July, and 10 different villages were attacked. It was kind of a coordinated assault on all of these Christian villages. By the time the attack was over, Pastor John had lost his wife and uh, four of their seven children and two of his grandchildren killed in this attack all in one day. And uh, as I sat with him, I was in Nigeria, and he's telling me this story, and he's describing the loss of life, and uh, it was terrible there. The house where they were hiding was burned, and so it was just a really horrific attack. And as he's telling me the story, it's just so heavy in the room, and it's, the story itself is so heavy on me that I'm I'm kind of praying in my spirit while he's talking. I'm like, Lord, I don't have anything to encourage this guy. Um, you know, this is a horrific story. How am I going to try to encourage him? What can I say? And I I felt like the Lord kind of planted in my mind the thought of the book of Job. And so, you know, because obviously Job knows what it's like to lose a whole family in short order. And so at the end of our time together, I just asked Pastor John, I said, you know, do you ever identify with Job? Do you do you read his story any differently now? And uh, he kind of smiled and he said, you know, since this happened, uh, I've preached sermons about the book of Job to my congregation. I, I've preached out of that story, out of that book. And he particularly pointed me to Job, and I, I think it's chapter 2, verse 10, where uh, Job's wife tells him, you know, why don't you just curse God and die? All this miserable stuff has happened to you. Why don't you give up on God? And Job turns to her and he says, how can we accept the good things from God and then not accept when hard times come? And Pastor John looked at me and he said, that's the verse that has jumped out at me. That's what I'm trying to hold on to. How can we accept the good things? and then reject God when we have hardship and trouble. And uh, I was incredibly encouraged by that because this is a guy who lost so much, basically lost his family in one day, and yet he continues to serve the Lord, he continues to pastor a church, and he even has managed to forgive the people who killed his family. He said, if I saw them on the street right now, I would go up, I would greet them, I would say hello to them. I don't hold a grudge, I don't hold anger towards them. Uh, and I thought that that's pretty supernatural that uh, God would give him the ability to forgive even the people who killed his wife and children and grandchildren. Yeah, that's one of the biggest miracles I've heard in all the interviews this year so far. And we've heard a lot of miracles um, to be able to forgive someone who kills half your family. Uh, it, I tell you what, the, it's the forgiveness... <laughs> The forgiveness of the persecuted believers is one of the greatest witnessing tools that God uses in hostile and restricted nations because, as you say, it is a miracle. There is not a natural explanation for it. It has to be something that God does. And if God does it, then he must be real. And so, you know, when, when the persecutors see that love and they see that forgiveness, they are really confronted with the reality that God is real and it is true. The Christian message is true. And then they have to make a decision. And so often that decision is, wait a minute, I want what that guy has because look what he went through and look how he's able to respond. Look how he's able to love and forgive. I want to be like that guy. And it is, one of, like I say, one of the biggest witnessing tools in hostile and restricted nations is God granting persecuted Christians the ability to forgive their persecutors? Yeah, I forget which famous Christian it was. Uh, the blood of the martyrs is the is the growth. Or Tertullian, yep. The, the, the blood yeah. of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Yeah, yeah. Well, if the seed doesn't die, then it will not grow, is what Jesus said. Um, so praise the Lord. That's some powerful, powerful ones. Um, so do you know Brother Union, uh, the heavenly man? Uh, I I have heard of him. I, I have a copy of his book, but I have not actually personally talked to him. Okay. Yeah, so what's the state of China right now? Because everybody just hears the economical side on the news and all that stuff, and they don't ever hear about this side. And then the Olympics was just a sham. That's what I like to say. Is that they, they put up all the best space for the TVs to see, but it's not like that at all. Am I right? 
Yeah, they're they're very good at PR. I actually spent some time just this week with Bob Fu from the China Aid Association, and uh, his perception and his take on it, and and he knows more about the Chinese house church than probably anybody, is that it's getting worse. And in fact, he shared some stories of uh, government-approved churches, three self-patriotic movement churches, that are now facing harassment and persecution from the government. And one of the things that is said in all of that PR spin is that if the Christians, if the house churches would just register with the government, then there wouldn't be any persecution. Then it would all be fine. The reality is now even the registered churches are facing persecution from the government. And uh, as I said, Bob said he's it's been worse in the last year, and he expects it to get worse still as we move forward. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, it's a sad thing, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes it gets darker before it gets light. Yeah, that's true. And again, though, the good news... It, in so many of these countries, we talk about the bad news of persecution, but we have to also talk about the good news. And China is another country where there is a great revival going on, and people are coming to Christ, churches are growing, and uh, people are worshiping together in spite of the risk and in spite of what the government is trying to do to shut them down. Yeah, I heard it's uh, about 100 million Christians now in China, and it's a billion population, and Hundred years ago, they only had maybe fifty thousand, hundred thousand Christians. I, I, I give away Watchman Nee books on my side. I like him a lot, and uh, and so once again, you know, if you're willing to go through the fire, then gold comes out on the other side, right? Yeah, that's that's so true. And uh, you know, I've heard that estimate, a hundred million. I've heard estimates as high as a hundred and twenty million Christians in China. And as you say, you know, 1949, it's estimated there were only fifty or sixty thousand Christians in the country. Wow. So we're going to wrap this up. Um, share, uh, I, do you guys still give away the free book and maybe share uh, anything else and how Christians can help and share the website and all that stuff if you could, please. Talk. I would be happy to. Persecution.com is our main website. Persecution.com. Come there. You can sign up for our free newsletter right on the front page. You can also request a free copy of Torture for Christ. That's the book that you mentioned and uh, really is a life-changing and challenging book. So Come to persecution.com. You can uh, request a free book, request our monthly newsletter. When you request the newsletter, we will send you that prayer map so you can put it up on your wall, see the countries where Christians are persecuted, and be able to pray effectively for them uh, throughout the year. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, a free a free book, guys. I don't know why everybody wouldn't just go and register and, and, and grab that now. I mean, this is the reason why we're doing the interviews uh, you listen. I, I like to challenge men and encourage women. Men, you listen to these interviews to grow in your faith. Well, it's time to grow. Go grab that stuff. Go read that book. Go get on fire for Jesus. And women, I encourage you to always serve and serve and serve the Lord and and win souls uh, in your circle of influence. And you know, guys, give money to the Voice of the Martyrs. They're they're a great organization. I believe they're building is debt free from what I heard. They're very financially responsible, and they're literally serving the people that you and I could not reach. You could take a plane to China or India, and you wouldn't be able to reach most of those people that they're serving. So thank you again for your time, Todd, and we will post the link to the website. That's great. I really appreciate you having me on, and I, I just join with you encouraging people, sign up for the newsletter, learn these stories. And uh, you will be challenged, you will be encouraged, and it will help you to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Thank you, brother. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.